Hi, I'm Kalila Reynolds, and welcome to another live edition of Taking Stock. We're bringing you all the latest business news and telling you how it will affect you and your money. Now, don't forget to head over to my website, kalilareynolds.com, once this live has ended, to get my newsletter straight to your inbox twice a week. Also, remember to hit that like button and subscribe to this channel. And of course, let us know where is everybody joining us from, right? Are you in you know, Jamaica, somewhere around the world? Now, here's a look at what's coming up in tonight's show, followed by what's hot in business. Come on, let's get this money. <laughs> Cinema operator Palace Amusement was heavily impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic. Well, Prime Minister Andrew Holness lifted curfew measures in March during his contribution to the 2022-23 budget debate. Has Palace Amusement benefited from the reopening of the economy? And the analysts weigh in on the latest market developments. Sibony Group has lost its preferred bidder, who had a vested interest of acquiring majority stake in the company. Maybury Investments is increasing the interest rate charged on its margin credit facility from from 12% to 15. Why? We'll find out. But first, here's What's Hot, brought to you by Jamaica Money Market Brokers, your best interest at heart. The government of Trinidad and Tobago is selling more shares in the majority state-owned First Citizens Bank. The government is selling almost 11 million of its shares in an additional public offer. If the offer is fully subscribed, the government could raise some 543 million TT dollars, or about 80 million US. This would reduce the government's stake to 60.11% in the bank. This will be the bank's second APO. Following its initial public offer in 2013, the bank conducted an APO in 2017. For the current APO, each share is priced at $50 TT. The offer opened on June 28 and is scheduled to close on July 22. The Development Bank of Jamaica and VM Investments have teamed up to offer some 15 million US dollars of capital support to small and medium-sized businesses. The support will be offered through the Jamaica Actors Small and Medium Enterprise Fund. The DBJ will provide 5.5 million US dollars to the fund through a partnership between the government and the World Bank. 500,000 US dollars will be set aside for technical assistance. In addition, VMIL has committed 10 million US dollars to the fund and will seek to raise additional capital through large institutional fund managers. According to the DBJ, the fund will support at least 15 SMEs by providing access to equity or quasi equity investments between 100,000 and 2 million US dollars. Focus is being placed on businesses operating in sectors such as technology, climate and renewable energy, agriculture, food security, health, hygiene and tourism. SMEs that apply for funding will need to have been operational for at least three years with 12 months requiring positive net income and cash flow. However, large and well-established global companies that are expanding their footprint in Jamaica and the Caribbean through a local SME will also be considered. Texaco's Jamaican operations are under new ownership. Gas and energy company, the Sol Group, has completed the acquisition of the Jamaica operations of GB Energy. The acquisition gives the Sol Group control over the GB-operated Texaco brand in Jamaica. That includes Texaco's retail, aviation, LPG or autogas, commercial and lubricants activities. Sol is the Caribbean's largest petroleum marketing company with presence in 22 markets across the Caribbean, Central and South America. Bad news for the Sibony Group and their speculators. The company announced that its interested buyer has withdrawn its offer to purchase the company. Sibony is currently a shell company having no assets. The company previously held properties in the tourism sector and was formerly the major investor in Sandals, Ocho Rios and Sibony Hotels. The news sent Sibony's stock price tumbling from the $1 range to $0.65 cents on Friday. It's official. Jamaica's central bank digital currency Jamdex is now legal tender. According to the Bank of Jamaica, it will now begin the national rollout of Jamdex following the gazetting of amendments to the Bank of Jamaica Act. The BOJ said that the Act now recognizes CBDC as legal tender that can be used along with regular banknotes and coins. Jamdex is used on a one-to-one -one exchange rate with the Jamaican dollar. Jamaicans will have to sign up for a CBDC-enabled digital wallet to use Jamdex. Currently, the only CBDC-enabled digital wallet in the country is the Link app. 
In his budget presentation in March, Minister of Finance Dr. Nigel Clark announced that the first 100,000 people to sign up for the Link app after April 1 would receive $2,500 worth of Jamdex from the government. The European Central Bank is set to raise its interest rates for the first time in 11 years later this month. The ECB is the central bank of the 19 European Union countries, which use the euro as their primary currency. In addition to the planned rate increase in July, the bank said it also plans to raise rates in September as it tries to taper raging inflation across the eurozone. In June, eurozone inflation reached a new record high of 8.6% year over year. The two planned increases could see the ECB's main interest rate returning to positive territory this year. The bank has had negative rates since 2014. What's Heart was brought to you by Jamaica Money Market Brokers, your best interest at heart. This segment of Taking Stock is brought to you by Bulwark Insurance Agency. Insurance made easy. And download today. Register using your existing NCB online banking login credentials. To open an account or get more info, contact our Wealth Hub today. Welcome back. Welcome back. So let me see who you are and where you're joining us from tonight. Shout out to Siobhan, who says, finally able to see this show live. Whoop, whoop. I love it when you guys join me live. Of course, you know, like up the video and share with your friends so people know what's going on. Let me see who else is joining us live tonight and where you are joining us from. I see Kingston, Jamaica. I see Giovanni is live from Portmore. Keisha Bailey is waiting in, or was waiting in Manchester. Now she's no longer waiting because you don't have to wait in vain for my love. <laughs> Raquel is also in Kingston and she says, you know, good night, money makers. Like the video and come in. Let me see who else we have here. Siobhan says, I've been watching Taking Stock and this person is in Montego Bay. And Kish, as usual, is checking in from London, England. Pick up yourself, Kish. So I posted a video on my Instagram just this evening because I passed by Sovereign. I know that they reopened the Palace Cinema there recently. And I was just thinking, because I've been there, I went to watch Doctor Strange a few weeks ago and it was empty and it was on a Monday night, two for one night. And you know, two for one night always ram at Palace, at least pre-COVID. It used to be ram. You couldn't even get a seat. And it was like super empty. So I started thinking about, okay, what is the future for this company? As you guys know, uh, Palace Amusement was heavily impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic, but the curfew measures were lifted in March this year. So <clears throat> about four months now since those uh, measures have been lifted. And, you know, I think they've been back to full operation, but we're going to find out tonight, you know, how they've been doing since then. Uh, they did benefit from the reopening of the economy. So let's join Melanie Graham. She's the marketing manager and director of Palace Amusement. Welcome back, Melanie. Hi, Kalila. It's been about a year since we last had you on. And the last time was because we were talking about Palace as being, in terms of stock price, the worst affected on the Jamaica Stock Exchange coming out of the pandemic. So that would have been 2020 to 2021. Mm -hmm. It's now been you know, another 12 months since then. Uh, tell me how these past 12 months have been for you, 12 to 18 months. They're about 2021 coming into 2022. Mm -hmm. It's it's really um, it's really been four months for us, and um, it has we started re the reopening started for us very well with Spider Man. Um, people that didn't know that we were open before found out that we were open then. So we did for for December. Um, Spider Man did exceptionally well um, and then we went into this year and we have been steadily progressing we have just i know you said cineplex but we have just opened it and so people are still saying oh we don't know that you're open you know and we are trying desperately to get the word out there that we are open but this year so far we have had some real blockbusters 
so to speak. And they have been doing pretty well. We started out, um, well, Spider-Man held over for this year. And then we had Doctor Strange. Then we went into Top Gun, um, Jurassic, Park, Jurassic World. And Minions is now on the screen. We are also looking forward to next week opening um, Love on Thor, Love on Thunder. So, Ooh. and and that is you know one of the the Marvel big um, uh, products. So we are looking forward to that. Um, I see. Yes, I, I'm hoping that the cinema will be packed. Um, a cineplex, uh, we we need to find a way of getting the word out that we are open there. Um, it has been it has been growing, and what we have been doing um, is a lot of um, school shows. We had the um, Gatfest Film Festival there, and um, rentals that sort of thing has been really um, helping us out because it's reintroducing Cineplex to say we are alive and we are out there. Yeah. Mm, so interesting. So I'm glad that you had that big reopening with Spider-Man because that, that was huge. And I did go to see that one as well. So, okay. but like I was saying in the opening, I went to watch a movie at Sovereign, Doctor Strange, which is another huge movie because mm -hmm. all these huge movies that had been delayed are now coming out. Mm -hmm. And I was surprised that it was, you know, it was pretty empty. So is it just that location that, you know, has been lagging or how, have it, how has it been over at, uh, at Carib? Yes, yes, um, it has been it has been good. That location has never the the half off, which is which is what we we call it now, because it is um, regardless of whether you come with somebody or not. The two for one said it ha you had to come with somebody, so you buy one ticket and you get one free. But that's not the case with half off. You just it's half of the regular price. And it's never really um, had that much of an impact at, on Cineplex. Um, we see a much greater interest in that in Carib, especially Carib. So those days um, are our better days. Monday, ni Monday nights and Tuesday uh, matinees. Plus, of course, um, Saturdays, Sundays, and even uh, the late shows on Fridays. But something very interesting that we have found is that since we have reopened, our late shows always did better than the early shows. But the figures, the, the, the attendance figures have been showing that most of the time we are doing better at the matinee shows than the late shows. I'm not sure. So that's the earlier show, that's the 5.30, 6 o'clock okay. show? Yes, yes. Hmm. I'm not sure what is responsible for that. Is it the crime? No, mm -hmm. I think maybe people have just gotten used to going out earlier. That could mm -hmm. be it. I right. could just get used right. to curfews. We get used to early shows and going right. to bed much earlier now. Right. So, After so, living with this for two years, it's kind of become habit now. Right, it's a matter of retraining, right? Right, because yeah. I even noticed that if I'm out on the road fairly late at night, like it's it's There's empty, nobody. it's deserted. Yes. Not like one time, even on say a Thursday night, which used to be fairly busy, mm -hmm. the road is not as as popping as it used to be. No, at no. all. It's like everybody just heads home. Mm -hmm. we, we got we've gotten used to our beds. <laughs> <laughs> That's not good for us. <laughs> so how how is the um the driving going? Because you know when you guys when in the height of the pandemic there was all this suggestion that you should do a drive in. You listened and you did the drive in. Are people still patronizing that? Mm -mm. Mm -mm. Not, <laughs> not really. Since, not since the indoor cinemas really opened up, and there were you know no curfews, no no. Um, no sort of any any serious problems that there, there. Um, the the attendance has dropped drastically at the drive-in. So is it safe to say that you're not going to be continuing with that? That's a serious consideration now. Yes. Mm -hmm. mm. 
it about is. how soon you think? Unfortunately, um, well, the, uh, the the contract that uh, allows us to um, be out of there by the end of August. The end of August. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Well, you have to do what makes sense for you. So if people aren't patronizing the driving anymore, Absolutely. I mean, it, it served a purpose at the yes. time when it was needed. We needed that space. But like you yes. said, now you're open in the other location. Yeah. So so there you go. You just have to. And there are many reasons for that. Um, one is um, the shopping center behind us there. They uh, recently reopened and they have some terrible it's not terrible for them, but for us, powerful um, um, security lights um, beaming that, that sort of floods our screen. Mm. Um, apart from that, we have so many, technology has changed so much since we had a drive-in. And so before, we never had to contemplate that people were not able to turn off their lights. And some cars, especially the high-end cars now, you can't really turn off the lights. So you have these lights in your rear view mirror and um, some people's cars have a problem with picking up the frequency on their radio. And if your battery is kind of low, you don't want to turn off your car anyway because um, you might start at the end of the show. And, and then the third thing is that there is a, a club, a nightclub um, to the, um, let's say, the north, the northwestern side of the, the compound. And especially on the weekends, they blast music. So, you know, it is, and people have become used to a certain um, production. Um, quality production of, of sound and, um, and sight, you know, visuals. So it's very, very difficult to, in, in fact, it's impossible to reproduce that same um, sound and visuals on an outdoor screen. Mm. Mm. I mean, back in the 1960s, the technology was a lot different. So, you know, it wor what worked then probably doesn't work now. Yeah. So the last time you came on as well, there was a lot of concern about the Portmore location because yeah. then you had the state of emergency and crime in Portmore right uh, after you made that investment. So how's that doing? It is doing much better since we reopened. And um, we, are, we are trying to you know, grow it. And it has, um, it has turned around, I would say, um, not what the potential is, absolutely not. But um, it is um, looking up for us, yes. Lavar Henry wants to know, when is the new Mandeville location scheduled to open? I want to know this too, because I live in Mandeville now too. Uh, he says, I think we will see a boom in the net profit. Why, why didn't you not go when we were open there? Well, I didn't live there then. <laughs> I, just, I recently moved there. Plus well, the highways going in. Uh -huh. Lots of businesses are going to Mandeville now. I see Sovereign, yeah, well, Sovereign is opening in Mandeville. Sovereign maybe, Center Mandeville is opening. Maybe we were before the time, the right time. But we were there and we spent a lot and we lost a lot. When was that? What year? Oh, uh, okay. It was um, uh, two, two, 2002, around there, some, somewhere. 2002, around. so 20 years later. So is it that you don't have a plan to go back to Mandeville? No. Oh, mm -hmm. it's the one thing they're missing, a movie theater. But um, um, Palace Amusement was there twice. Oh, there before was, that as well? Yes, they had a, a very... Um, old cinema there i mean went way back that cinema um and the attendance fell off you know it seems as though kingston um people go out and uh, are out late at night um a lot more than people in mandible i don't know whether it's because of the cold or what but at a certain time like 
eight, nine o'clock in the night, everybody is gone. Hmm. Interesting. And, you know, I've been looking at the comments here on this program as well. And I see the, the viewers now saying that 610 is late. So Siobhan says 610 is is late for a movie. And then Siobhan yeah. again saying yeah. we need 530 movies. So some people say that they want, they prefer the earlier times. now. we just, you know, developed a new habit. Right, right. Um, I know there have been a few calls, but, you know, some of the people... We, for 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 sunshine to have an early show we did when we started we had an early show um but later on we um realized when we saw the attendance we had to cut down on the um, amount of shows that we had and also the times and we realized that a lot of people that would work in kingston could not get back over to the cinema or wanted to go home first and you know change and have something to eat maybe and come back out. So uh, that time was, was put specifically because um, Portmore has always been for us um, a late, a late town, a late city. City. Mm -hmm. So um, Yes, yeah, so that, that accounts for that. And we have had recently, we had some people ask uh, about early, early show times. And we have tried it on the weekends, putting in an, um, an early show, but it has not been, um, it doesn't make sense for us. Because for any show that you put in earlier, we'd have to take, take in other words, in, in other words, not to, to have to pay a lot of overtime we would have to take off another show and mm -hmm. wouldn't want to um, contemplate that right now because they still do pretty well. Mm -hmm. Investopedia has this comment. I genuinely think the theaters need to revamp and do a vast upgrade to attract customers. Do you agree with that? And if so, what plans do you have for any upgrades at your cinemas? I am not sure exactly what he means by revamping and upgrading um i'm not sure so maybe if he could be more specific you know all right investopedia be more specific what what revamping do you want the cinemas to do i think the cinemas are, are quite nice I, I don't know what exactly they're talking about indeed so let's look at some of the impact on your business and some of the things that you've done financially over the past year you had a loan financing partnership with victoria mutual investments that was 653 million dollars so what was that for <laughs> That was to pay out, we had, um, at the beginning of the pandemic, we had some loans with uh, Nova Scotia. So a big part of that went to paying out um, that loan. Um, then there was, um, because we have a two-year <clears throat> moratorium, um, some money was put into... Um, an, an escrow account or an account that would earn interest to help pay off um, what we would have needed to pay, the interest payments in that period. Um, so that has been difficult to navigate because we have not, we, you, we still don't have that big uh, disposable income, you know, uh, to use. And we have to be very, very careful with how we spend what we have. Mm. Lavar wants to know, with the growing rate of technology, what plans does Palace have to diversify its portfolio? Do you have any plans to do that? It's primarily cinema, and then you also have the concession. Uh, yes. Do you have any plans to do anything beyond that? Not at this time. Not at this time. You, you'd have to have you'd have to have money to do that. So, and um, I'm not too sure. We have been uh, for a hundred years uh, a cinema company. So, um, 
uh, I'm not too sure where we would go from here. I mean, we have investigated several several other um, areas, um, but they have not um, proved uh, fruitful at this time. Mm. Uh, a similar question from Ryan. Well, related. Ryan wants to know when will you bring IMAX to the Palace amusement business? Why? Why do you laugh? What is that comment? Be because it is of a very, it's a great, um, big financial investment. You, it would be almost impossible, if not impossible, to retrofit anywhere that we have now to accommodate IMAX. It would have to be built for that specific purpose. Okay, so for those who don't know, what, what is IMAX? It is, um, it is a very big screen, a very, very big screen. Um, and you would have to have the space and it is, it, it's, it's sort of, um, it's not a flat screen, it curves slightly. So that would be suitable for back in the day when Palace used to, when Carib used to be one big theater. <laughs> um, right. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Carib, for those of you who are too young to know, and I, I only know because somebody told me, Carib <laughs> used to be one big, big theater. So now you have what, six screens in there? Five, five five screens in there yeah it all used to be one big thing so everybody you know go in there that that could be an IMAX or could have been if the technology was around at that time mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. next question comes from Roger Roberts who says do you believe that if Carib Cinema should offer more movie special offers this can help bring in more customers in addition what about creating an app for Carib see our, our viewers have all kind of ideas for you I Melanie Yes, yes. Um, we're looking at um, a, a mobile app, um, but not specifically for Carib, but for the, the, all the cinemas. Um, as far as special offers go, I, I'm not sure if um, everybody knows um, what it is that we, that we have, you know? Um, we have the, the half off, of course, which is two days, Monday and Tuesdays. We have movie vouchers, which we sell, and that's different packages, depending on the, the amount that, of, that you buy. Each package, each ticket cost would be slightly, it's a, um, <clears throat> it is a discounted uh, ticket, and it depends on the amount that you would purchase. Um, so, uh, that also is, we do school shows. We have um, uh, senior citizen, senior citizen um, specials. When I say specials, they can go anytime, but they get a special rate, the senior citizens. And um, student rate with, with an ID, okay, from a, an institution. Up to university? Yes, 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 absolutely. Yeah. Perfect. Right. So, Melanie, I know you told our producers that, you know, you're not the finance lady in the company. <laughs> you're very clear about that. But let me just uh, mention it to our viewers, because this is an investment show primarily. We do talk numbers on this show. Mm -hmm. And so for the nine months ended March 31, 2022, you recorded a net loss of $268 million. Mm -hmm. And that's 2022, March 31, 2022. You know, mm -hmm. so that's that's fairly recent. Yeah. And that's actually more than the previous year, 2021, when you had a loss of $254 million. So mm -hmm. the loss was exacerbated in mm -hmm. 2021. And I know that we're awaiting the, the Q4 results. And mm -hmm. with the caveat that you're not the finance person, and I know that there are limited things that you can speak to before the results are published, but do you sense that you'll make a recovery in this quarter just ended June? Um, who knows, not, not, not probably not substantial because um, reopening in itself has a lot of costs and they have been more than really we anticipated. When you, you turn off equipment and leave it idle for so long, whether it is um, a freezer, 
um, uh, a projector, all, all sorts of equipment. They are meant to run. They are meant to keep running. And um, when you turn them off and turn them back on, they don't always work. So apart from the, the added costs of um, having opened up, so we're having more shows and all of that, so it's more staff that we have to be paying, um, and all of these other unknown things that we have had to deal with um, in the last couple of months. Mm, okay, yeah, absolutely understandable. So we have some reactions to your statement that you, you don't have any plans to go back to Mandeville. This is not coming from me. This is coming from the viewers, right? So Chantel says, what exactly does she mean by not reopening the theater in Mandeville? No, sir. Mandeville needs that. <laughs> and then it's followed by another comment from Lanesra, who says, 20 years ago to now, things have changed. Maybe if you went to Portmore 20 years ago, you'd have the same view about it, like how you have with Mandeville now. So I don't know. I'm, I'm new to the, to the town, so I don't know what things were like there 20 years ago. But it's maybe it's something to consider, especially, I would say, since the highway is coming to Mandeville and it's expected to be completed by March. And, you know, the commute between Kingston and Mandeville is going to be a whole lot shorter. I anticipate that more Kingston people or people from this side are going to be, you know, moving that side to access uh, cheaper house prices, especially with everything that's going on in the housing market. Mm -hmm. And so it may be that following that, you're going to see people um, looking for nightlife in Mandeville and, and movies. Uh, something to consider. What do you think? Oh, yeah. we, we, nothing is ever totally off the table, you know, but um, <laughs> the, and at least not in the foreseeable future. Um, we need to take ourselves, get ourselves out of this hole um, before we could um, consider that kind of risk. Because we heard that before, you know. We heard, oh, we need a cinema in Mandeville. The place is so dead. We need to, you need to have something, some form of entertainment. And that's why we got in there. And it, and it never worked. It just never did, did work. Well, let's see. There's been some development in, in 20 years. So, I don't know. I perhaps, hear an, yeah. perhaps an assessment. Maybe next year after the highway, you could do an assessment and see what the situation is looking like. If it's, you know, if it would be feasible this time around. Lobbying on my own behalf. Let me see. I hear you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So what movies can we expect to see soon? I know you mentioned Thor, the new Thor oh, movie. Yes. Any, any other big any other big titles coming to the screen uh, soon? Oh, um, well, definitely. Well, we have we have for the children because it's summer, you know. Mm -hmm. So um, we have um, Pause of Fury and um, DC League of Super Pets for the summer, and then um, in the in the fall, we are going to be having in early November Black Panther. Ooh, right! And in December, we're going to be having another uh, avatar avatar yes that's been hot that's been like what at least 10 years since the last avatar came out a little more than oh. a minute. yeah and, mm -hmm. and the first one was huge was yes. really good so this one is gonna be highly anticipated and yes. so too yes. black panther black panther was your highest grossing movie wasn't it yes it certainly was I remember reading about that in the paper is that you guys did very, very well from, from Black Panther. So we are hoping and praying and that people will come out and that we will see a return to our um, good bottom line. All right. Well, I hope that for you as well, because I am somebody, I like movies, so I don't want to see Palace go anywhere. I want to see you continue to thrive and expand, and I'm wishing you all the best, Melanie. Thank you so much. Thank you. And thanks for coming on. And, and uh, please, I am hoping to see you and everybody else at the movies. We need each and every one. 
Absolutely. Okay. So that was Melanie Graham from Palace Amusement. Guys, the cinema is back open. I saw somebody say, where is the comments? Somebody is like, uh, Palace needs to promote more because they didn't know of all these things that, that she just mentioned. So yeah, just, I mean, for, for me, for Sovereign, it was pretty obvious when it reopened because you have that big, what is it called, a billboard, that big uh, sign, the cinema sign there that was empty for the past two years. And then all of a sudden you started seeing movies, you know, being listed on that cinema sign at Sovereign. Uh, that was, that's pretty big promotion if you live in that general vicinity and you pass by there regularly like I do. So uh, yeah, so that's, that's part of how they promote, but I agree there could be some more done and I hope that you guys you know, take her up and go watch a movie. I like the movies. Let's keep Palace in business. So tonight's poll question is on a different topic. It is actually about Siboney. So you may have heard the news. Well, if you tuned into the show early, you saw it in What's Hot in Business, or you may have seen it on my social media, on Instagram, Twitter, that Siboney's potential buyer has withdrawn their offer. And if you recall that uh, the news that they had a potential buyer and that they were pretty close to working out a deal that had sent the stock price going up and up and up. And now the stock price has fallen again. And because the potential buyer has withdrawn their offer, no deal. So what's your reaction to that news? A, eh? I still have faith in Siboney because you know, now that the stock price is down, maybe you can get it cheaper and you still have faith that somebody else is going to buy. So A, I still have faith in Siboney. B, I give up. I'm out. C, drinking water and minding my business or other, let us know in the comments. What's your reaction to that news? And while you're at it, reminding you again to hit that like button. Up next, we've got your market recap and the analysts are standing by. This segment of Taking Stock was brought to you by Bulwark Insurance Agency. Insurance made easy and... Download today. Register using your existing NCB online banking login credentials. To open an account or get more info, contact our Wealth Hub today. Scotia Elevate is a new life insurance plan from Scotia Insurance for the big thinkers and go-getters. Stay protected with up to $12 million in life coverage and up to $6 million in accidental death and dismemberment. Plus, enjoy customized investments to help build your network. Learn more at jm.scotiabank.com. Time now for your market recap. The Jamaica Stock Exchange advanced last week with the combined index gaining 4,000 points or 1%. 119 stocks traded across both the main and junior markets of the JC for the week ending Friday, July 1, 2022. 63 advanced, 47 declined, and 9 stayed at the same. 160 million shares changed hands on the Jamaican dollar market, totaling $2.9 billion. Dollar Financial was the week's most traded stock, taking up 15% of market volume. The stock gained 14 cents to open the new week at $2.92. Barita Investments traded the second highest volume with people buying almost 23 million shares in the company. The stock's price gained $1.25 to open the new week at $87.96. And Wigton Wind Farm rounded out the most traded, taking up almost 9% of market volume. The stock gained 1 cent to open this week at 56 cents. Now let's see who else had the biggest gains for the week. iCreate was last week's biggest gainer. The stock price jumped nearly 27% to close last week at $4.17. The stock was also June's second biggest gainer up 46%. The jump follows last week's episode of Taking Stock, where iCreate founder and CEO Tyrone Wilson broke the news that the company will be acquiring outdoor digital advertising company Visual Vibe. Pulse was the week's second biggest gainer. The stock price rose nearly 22% to close at $4.38. And rounding out our biggest gains, Radio Jamaica is up almost 21%. The stock gained 50 cents to open the week at $2.90. On the losing side now, Sibony was last week's biggest loser down 59% to close last week at 65 cents after news broke last week that Sibony's potential buyer has backed out. Margaritaville Turks fell 23% to open this week at $16.50. The stock was also June's biggest loser, falling almost 
And rounding off the week's biggest losers, SSLVC lost 19% to close at $2.86. However, the stock was June's biggest gainer, rising 49% to close last month at $2.94. Now here's a look at some of the other highlights for the month of June. The main index declined by almost 3%. The junior market advanced by 3%. The financial index declined by almost 3%. And the manufacturing and distribution index declined by 2%. CAC 2000 was the month's third biggest gainer behind iCreate. The stock opened July at $10 after gaining 35%. On the losing side now, Cygnus Real Estate Financial was June's second biggest loser after Margaritaville Turks. The stock dropped 20% to end June at $12.43. And main event fell nearly 19% to open July at $6.67. Over on the Trinidad and Tobago Stock Exchange, the composite index advanced last week, gaining 10 points. Grace Kennedy was the most traded stock. It opened this week at $5.50 TT. Cinema One was the market's biggest gainer up 31% to open this week at $5.20 TT. And on the losing side, LJ Williams Limited fell 6% to open the new week at $1.95 TT. Over in the U.S., the Dow Jones ended last week down 1%, while the S&P 500 fell 2% and the Nasdaq fell 4.5%. There was a slight dip in prices at the pumps last week, with gas and diesel prices falling by 25 cents. In foreign exchange, it took an average $151.56 Jamaican to purchase one US dollar last Friday. And on the crypto markets, Bitcoin is now trading below $20,000 US. The cryptocurrency fell almost 3% in the past five days, trading at 19,521 US dollars on Monday, while Ethereum fell almost 1% in the past five days, trading at $1,089 on Monday. All right. Welcome back. Welcome back. Let's take some of your comments at this point before we get into the analyst segment, starting with TaylorMade Vacation Rental says, where are people selling palace stocks? I have never seen any for sale. <laughs> Good question. It is a very, very tightly held company. I, I give you that. So at one point, palace was pre-pandemic palace was over $2,000. It was the most expensive stock on the stock exchange. Still is at 800 and something, one of the most expensive stocks, if not still the most, I have to check, on the Jamaica Stock Exchange. And it's still very, very tightly held. So it's not one of them that is easily available for sale. Niche says needs competition. Uh, once upon a time, they had quite a bit of competition and they all fell by the wayside over the past 100 years. Never forget that. This is a company that has been in operation for 100 years. So they're very resilient. Ryan Wallace talking about Mandeville. He said 66,000 people and the high land price is not helping Mandeville's development. You know, you, you kind of have a point because I expected property prices to be much, 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 much lower than Kingston. And they are lower, but not as low as I expected because, you know, you still have some money people over Mandeville. Mandeville is a, a, a fairly stush place, you know. Uh, Raquel Francis says, we need to start going back to the theater and make it better for Carib to expand. And then Ryan commenting on Sibony says, what does Sibony have now to keep investors interested? And then Chantel saying, uh, is this about Carib or Siboney? I think it's about Carib. Yeah, so Chantel saying, I believe that if marketing is better, the company can start seeing business pick up uh, um, again and perhaps again. Then as soon as it beefs up, just drop an APO and keep things rolling. There might be interest in it since, uh, since like I said, it's so tightly held and it's a, a stock that is difficult to get. Uh, going back to Siboney Heisenberg. I like your name, Heisenberg, Breaking Pad. It says, Sibony was my very first stock purchase. Wow, you are brave to choose that as your very first. But it paid off because I made, or he made, or she, I don't know who Heisenberg is, 70% uh, gain on it. So, hey, good job with that one. Uh, it paid That risk paid off. And then Richie says, Sibony right now is literally a shell company. No assets, no business activity and very little to no cash. So you were asking, what does Sibony have to keep investors interested? Well, they still have their listing on the JSE. 
<laughs> yeah. So there is a possibility that somebody else might want a ready-made company without having to go through that entire process to list. And that is one of the major topics the analyst segment tonight. It is time for the analysts. We only have one today, it's this evening. Um, I'm joined by business writer at The Observer, David Rose. Hi, David. Hey, Kalila. Welcome back. Lag. I realize I lag the, the connection. Uh, I'm to try to back and come back. Uh, yeah, maybe you can try that. Yeah. Yeah. So David, as you call, was ill last week, and you know we didn't get to have him on. So I'm glad that he's feeling much better this week, and he is back with us. So we want to talk about Siboni. Let me see some other comments from you. Let me see. Uh, okay, let's go back to the comments page, comments section. Where? Where did my thing disappear to? What's going on over here? I'm not I'm not able to see the new comments coming in for some reason. Re, all right. So Julian says Barita was only was the only exceptional APO. Uh Siobhan says JPS is higher. Higher than what? I don't I don't know what that was ex, uh, responding to. Ryan says PBS is the most expensive. How much were PBS stock? That's one that I haven't looked at in a very, very long time. I think Massey is also more expensive, but it's, no, they did a stock split, so it would have come down. Um, Siobhan says, I don't see any uh, returns whenever there is an APO. And if you tuned in from the very beginning of the show, you would have seen us talking about in What's Hot in Business, we're talking about an APO for First Citizens Bank in Trinidad and Tobago. So they are you know, doing an additional public offer. Always remember that opportunity is not only in Jamaica, there are opportunities outside of Jamaica as well. There's Trinidad and Tobago, there's the Barbados Stock Exchange, there is the US Stock Exchange, and we plan to have a discussion on that one uh, next week about the First Citizens Bank APO. David is back with us. Any back. any luck, David, with your internet connection? Yeah, I'm back. All right, sure all right. So, yeah, okay. So hopefully yes, things, yeah, hopefully you things run smoothly first now. Offer first? Hmm? You, want to, you want to discuss the First Citizens Offer first? No, let's go with Siboney first, because it's been nearly nine months hunting for a buyer to purchase this majority stake in Siboney. <laughs> and you know, Finsac is now weighing its options because the preferred bidder has withdrawn its interest in acquiring the majority interest in the majority stake in, in Siboney. So what does this now mean for the even before we go to what it means, explain what happened as far as you know. So Simone back in October, Simone tried again, sorry, not Simone, apologies. Finsac tried again to dispose of its 72% stake in Simone. It was like ad advertisements in the Gleaner. And, you know, they got some interested bidders. We're not sure what, what the process took so long because it was closed up from November when it was extended. And, you know, they just came back uh, and back in the start of June and said, hey, we have these bidders. Everything should be finalized soon. And then... On June 30, that was it. Uh, the bidder said, I was at June 30 earlier in the week, but last week they said, like, update, you know, preferred bidder stepped back after they got government approval to dispose of the state. Because for those who don't know, in the course during the 90s when we had the full uh, financial crash that we had in our country, and that's really, you know, an entity that came in to collect some of these companies so that they didn't crash, like your NCB, your Sagicore and Guardian Life, a lot of these businesses were either smaller or different or you know, much bigger before FinSAC. And also small businesses now are foreign owned in essence. So what happened as a result is that FinSAC, you know, sold the last piece of property they had in Sibani back in 2018. He paid out a dividend, which actually was larger than the stock price. And, you know, what happened now is they're trying to get rid of the company that they no longer need to hold it. So the current predicament for Sibani is they have about $1.2 million worth of cash. And the thing is, you know, when Sibani's stock price goes up, that kind of brings it closer to its end because listing the JSC is not free, nor any stock exchange. You have to pay listing fees, which is actually tied towards your market capitalization. So mm. the greater value Sibani actually has, 
the Mercosur and a listing fee, which is payable at the start of each year. And the thing is, we don't know how long somebody actually can hold on between paying their current fees and everything else before they have to just, or in this case, have to just declare bankruptcy because the reality is there's no assets, no operations. They have the large shareholder base, they're listed. So there is still interest, potential interest of a new, another buyer. But right now, how fast can they, they, can they do another bid that follows government regulation at the same time satisfies the ability to sell within a particular time frame that the company can still be operational. So they may actually have to delist because they can't uh, afford those fees. How, how yes. often do you have to pay the fees? Annually? It's annual. It's annual. So I have a rule book in front of me right now, but the main market companies pay more than the junior market companies. So if your company actually has, let's say, for example, a market capitalization of $500 million, you hardly pay $800,000. When it comes on to like a billion dollars plus, you probably pay a million dollars up. But that's kind of the premise, though, still, in the sense that the larger your company is, you know, your company is by the market, market determined, the more you're paying listing fees. So as a result, Sibony is basically you know, just an, a, taking a time at this point, meaning it's either they, a buyer comes in or they just start functioning altogether. Do you know how much those fees are? No, I'm trying to actually bring, I'm bringing it up right now. So just give me a second. But uh, listing fees aren't usually that expensive. I think the highest is like $2 million. But at the same time, as I said, similar to the stock price being current high rate is right now and kind of going up more and more. Actually, it's costing them more when, when they have to pay it when January comes. Just paid every January. And we're basically in July now. So if they do survive all the way to the end of December, the listing fees are coming and you have to pay them. So while Sibonia has maintained their sales in terms of complying with JSC rules and so forth, at the same time, they still need to be able to pay the JSC listing fees. Mm, so, so the clock is really ticking for Siboney. If they don't find a buyer by December, they're going to have to make a decision. Will we pay this $2 million plus? Uh, I found it, Kalila. Mm -hmm. So the annual listing fee for companies between 500 million to 1 billion dollars worth of share capital, uh, sorry, market capitalization is $352,107. There's not necessarily that much money, but as I said, if any price goes back even further and further, it's going to just cost the company more money to just stay in operation. Mm -hmm. And remember, that, remember the thing is that they also- And they have, have no money. income, so- They just have cash. And the thing is, they have an agent they have to hold by October 16, because they actually apply to the relevant minister to get an extension, because they were supposed to have the AGM by June 16, but approved for the minister to actually hold it by October 16 now, so that was AGM fees they need to go and pay now to host. So you have all these expenses coming, and the thing is, the, the main buyer just stepped away. And, you know, things I guess they're going to give, say, when you're olive branch and say, hey, we have to serve a little bit more to actually try and survive. No. SSLV, SSL kind of make a lot of SSL VC to survive until MFS acquired them. But in the case of Sibony, I don't think Mexico is going to get a kind of olive branch to really extend out unless there is the there is a confirmed buyer, there is a definitive signed agreement because it, it's really it's kind of just rough for some person to you know run up into that quote unquote training opportunity and now it's not like you have the opportunity to say I can probably sell it a minor loss or whatever. So Tariq is optimistic still. Tariq says it can get there. Look like the directors are building relationship with other markets and cross. I'm sure he meant to write listing, cross listing. Is, it, is that first is that first isn't because Sibony doesn't have an operation? Don't know. I don't it's know why shell. you know that we don't know Tariq. <laughs> like it's a shell. It is a shell. Like the shell even on this and this and the beach. That's what Sibony is at this point. The, the benefit, okay, so for those who why Sibony wants, the majority wants to sell the ownership to another company wants to list on the JSC. So, in essence, this on the JSC, you have to raise capital, right? You have to pay listing fees, you have to pay lawyers, X, Y, Z. And even if your offer actually is the amount of capital that is required, if you don't meet the minimum number of shareholders, you have a problem. So, the fact that Sibony is already here, has a shareholder base, is in commerce with JSC rules, it's to be easy to do a reverse takeover, potentially do a small capital raise to just change the business structure. 
but it's just kind of a sad situation. Mm. All right. Well, this is definitely one that we keep our eyes on at the very minimum for the rest of 2022. See what happens between now and December. Six months is still a fairly long time to, to get something done. It happens so for all you Sibony speculators expenses, out there. The expenses, huh? the expenses, that's the problem. Yeah. You have, to, you have to pay your bills. You have to pay your bills. And that's the reality. So <clears throat> let's talk about the First Citizens Bank APO just a little bit, David. We just want, want to touch on it because I want to have a more extensive discussion about it next week. But who is First Citizens Bank in Trinidad and Tobago? So First Citizens Bank is the government's bank, basically. So like how NTU was the government's bank when Pinsk acquired it, <laughs> or the government had a majority stake at one point. Uh, First Citizens actually is a, a bank or a financial institution that is owned by the three government to Trinidad and Tobago. So they have an investment arm, they have a banking arm in Barbados, they have a business in Costa Rica. They actually have a, a source stake in Term Finance Holdings, which is the parent company of Term Finance Jamaica, which Panjam has a stake in. So, you know, they're quite, quite fairly spread out in a sense, and they're one of the largest financial institutions in the region. I don't think they're not going to institute in Jamaica, but at the same time, they're quite large. And, you know, persons actually was kind of formed in a sense from a similar situation uh, like Guardian Life, where there was a financial crisis back in the 1990s was about, about Trinidad. And, you know, there was Trinidad Workers Union, for, and, there, and I believe it was what? Yeah, I think it, they, have a, they have a bank in Trinidad called NCB, and, you know, National Commercial Bank, and a workers bank as well. And what happened is that Central Bank just came in, created a new bank called First Citizens Bank, and the rest is history. And so it is a pretty big bank. And for those of you who are thinking First Citizens, this name sounds familiar. If you remember a few months ago when there was all this write-up about Barita in Trinidad Express newspaper, a lot of it had to do with First Citizens Bank purchasing shares in Barita's. Was it in Cornerstone that First Citizens has, has shares so in? First Citizens Investment Services, which is a subsidiary, is the one that actually bought this stake into Barita. They have a 6% stake in Barita right now. And they were the ones who came together to bring Massey to the JSC. So that's why, you know, names are sounding familiar to you guys. So this is who First Citizens Bank is. And they're now doing an APO, an additional public offer. I see somebody in the comments saying that it's really an offer for sale. And, and I can understand why you're saying that, because it's the government that's selling some more of their shares to the public. So it's not necessarily new shares being created, which is what we different, typically think of as an legal, APO. But that's that's how they've phrased it in in the media over there. So no, no, however you want to think different. about it, there are shares now available for sale in First Citizens Bank in Trinidad and Tobago. Have Actually, you had a chance to, to glance at any any of the, the offer documents yet? So it's actually First Citizens Group Financial Holdings. They restructured last year. They're still going through the process to uh, vest out the different subsidiaries under the common holding company. But yeah, I've gone through the prospectus to an extent, you know, it's in essence, you say if you have about 2,000 shares and under, which is about 10,000 TT, then you're almost in essence guaranteed that, uh, sorry, 10,000, 10, $100,000 worth of purchases. Sorry, 2,000 shares, which is 100,000 TT, you're in essence guaranteed almost all of those shares. And they've actually given a structure as to how people are all subscribed, what will happen in terms of who gets priority in the pro rata allotment basis. And you know, this offer is just for the government to actually raise fresh capital for their budget. So persons are going to had an IP back in 2013, government sold some of its shares, and it was the largest IP in Trinidad history. It was mm -hmm. three times oversubscribed. I cannot show you how big a deal it was. But when it came to 2018's APO, that was undersubscribed by like 34%. So you know it's going to be interesting to see what happens this time around with this current offer. Especially since the government, Trinidad, you know, wants to raise its cash at the same time, they're, you know, creating greater shareholder base in the public, in essence, because over in Trinidad, they look at some of these companies, you realize that most other companies, like, for example, I think it's Trinidad NGL and a couple of TTSC companies, the majority of the shareholders actually government entities. So, but the government actually creates an, another way for persons to actually have interest in. In this case, persons financial group who actually said last week at a media interview that they're looking to go into 
Guyana and Jamaica for banking services, that's, that's a pretty big deal. All right. The last topic for this evening, David, is regarding Mayberry Investments. They're raising their interest rates on their margin credit facility. So that's going from 12% to 15%. And of course, you guys are well familiar with the news that the Bank of Jamaica continues to increase its own policy rate. So first of all, David, what's a margin loan? <laughs> Explain what that is. So it's basically a secure loan. So you have two different loans, secured and unsecured. A secured loan is where you have a, an asset held against the value of the loan to an extent. So, for example, in the case of Mayberry, you know, it's really used mainly by, as you would say, general investors with stock, stock portfolios. So you just see a million dollar portfolio, right? Mayberry loans it to borrow up to 40% of your portfolio, which would be $400,000. You then take that $400,000 and then, you know, investor, you want to invest it. And you pay back Mayberry over what time frame you want to pay them back. And that's just really how a margin loan works. You're borrowing against the value of existing assets you have, and you just do with whatever you want with the money. You can invest it, you can take an emergency, and really pay your kids' school fee. It's whatever you want to do. So that's really just it. But most servants, you know, take advantage of the actual flexibility of the margin, which is up by Mayberry, to invest back into the JSC. So other brokers, for example, require you to pledge your shares at the JCSD and pay a fixed, a fixed repayment schedule on the margin loan, quote unquote margin loan. Mayberry is actually like a true margin. Mayberry offers only the, only you know, maybe in the market here in Jamaica, Mayberry is the only broker that technically offers a true margin loan, meaning you pay by the loan as you deem fit, they accrue the interest on your account and so forth. So when I have my margin loan overseas, I don't need to repay back uh, tomorrow on a fixed repayment schedule, no. I just repeat when I need to, you know, and if my portfolio goes in value, I can then sell some of my portfolio for the margin loan that I've used. And, you know, it's basically leverage. And using leverage, you know, works in your favor in the sense that if you have a $1.4 million portfolio versus $1 million portfolio, you can go that money a lot quicker and compound it even further. Mm. So what's the significance of them going from 12% to 15%? Because that's a pretty big jump in one go. Well, you have to kind of put it into context in the Kalila. You have to remember that right, for the financial institutions, right? You lend money, you get interest income, right? But how do you fund uh, those loans? Do you use your own money or do you use somebody else's money? So, you know, for example, maybe we'll have loans and even do repurchase agreements, and that's pay interest expense on those, you know, facilities. As the Bank of Jamaica increases policy rate, and even the Federal Reserve increases its own policy rate, maybe you know, is basically facing higher interest expense costs on its uh, different facilities. So you know, they have to maintain a particular margin spread for their own purposes, but it's very profitable to them to an extent. And the thing is, significance of them is fifteen percent. Is actually, you know, basically in the realm of an unsecured loan. So if you go to a commercial bank and it's probably an unsecured loan and you have no general credit or whatever, that 15% is kind of what you're probably getting in a sense. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of significant, you know, that a security right. is kind of giving unsecured vibes. And, you know, <laughs> you're very right. Mayberry. It's not this Mayberry. Like VM well themselves have also increased their margin loan facility interest rates as well. So like somebody pointed out that uh, they take the five-year tenure, five-year loan has gone from like 10 to 13% interest rate. So it's not necessarily like just a neighbor as the thing, but the banks, Mayberry, the same which society, everybody's increasing interest rates to adjust for the increased cost of funding. Well, the thing is that, you know, unsecured loans are now about 15%, but for how long will they be at that rate, TV? Because those no, are probably no, no. going up into... Depends on which yeah. bank you go to and depends on your credit oh, history. Yes. But even then, the new facilities that have been offered to persons, if you already have a loan exit already, it's going to cost you a lot more. Mm -hmm. And the thing mm -hmm. is, the banks might require you to take shorter 10 years to pay back a loan. So in the past, you're probably gotten like, for example, 9, 10 years on a car loan and you're getting less. And that is just the reality we're facing right now, where everybody is adjusting their positions to account for the increased costs that we're facing in this environment. Because, well, maybe, maybe 
when you might be facing quote unquote inflation to an extent on their money like that, the increased call, interest expense they're facing is eating into their into their margins. Yeah. Thanks for that, so, David. Appreciate you. And I'm glad that you're feeling better this week. Just came on for the for you and the fans. I'm actually going back to bed after this. Oh, all right. Rest up. All right. Thanks again, David. So guys, you know what's happening with inflation. You know what's happening with interest rates right now. If you are able to lock in whatever you can lock in, if it even means prepaying for a service. So I saw, you know, I got to express fitness, right? Express gym. And I had paid for the year because you get a discount. You get a, you get three months free when you pay for the year. And I paid for the year like couple months ago and I just got an email saying that they're raising their rates and I'm like well thank goodness I, I, I paid for the year because I basically locked in my rate for the next you know the next 12 months um same thing goes for any other thing that you are able to to prepay for because you're able to lock in the current rate since prices for everything are just going up and up and up if you're able to get a fixed interest rate right now i saw i did an interview with was it which agency was it dbj i think it was and they have a particular loan facility for businesses uh, specifically for SMTE, small and medium tourism enterprises. And the gentleman said, you know, right now we are even willing to fix that interest rate. And I think the interest rate was about 5%. So they do have concessionary loans out there, depending on what you are borrowing for. And he said that they're even willing to fix that interest rate for, you know, whatever the loan repayment is. So if you are able to, to get something that is fixed, that is the way to go right now because the rates are going up and up and up so whatever you can lock in right now try lock it in for me please yeah let's take a quick break remember to like the video perfect time to hit that like button as somebody said if we have over 200 people watching and only 77 likes that is unacceptable i'm going to take your final comments after this break Hey, Moneymakers, you're not an official part of the family until you have your merch. Visit KhalilaReynolds.com slash store to order your t-shirt and your mask today. Let's get this money. See, and that price hasn't gone up in two years either. Get your t-shirt and your mask today. All right, let me take a few more comments from you guys. So this idea is coming from Kemar, who says... This for Palace, show something else other than movies like Champions League and Premier League and other sports and entertainment. That is an interesting concept. Would you go to the movie theater to watch uh, Champions League or Premier League? Let me tell you something. <laughs> That's a whole rights issue, a different type of rights issue because getting acquiring the rights to show those that type of content is a whole big business. As as Ali at Sportsmax, who we had on, well, formerly of Sportsmax, now of Verticast Media, uh, all about that business because that is a very expensive venture acquiring the rights to show these type of sporting events. You know, you know about Olympics and. Uh, um, the World Cup and all these sporting events, it's very, very expensive to acquire the rights. But there are also other events. So hmm, it could be it could be something for them to consider if uh, an artist has a, a concert. Like I'd probably go to Palace to watch a Beyonce concert, you know, in real time. That would be pretty cool. But then again, there's the whole acquiring the rights to it. So if it can be profitable, who knows? Maybe it could be a good idea. Abigail says, just as how just how we have upcoming movies promoted on IG, the services Palace offers can be promoted as well. They do have a, a fairly small presence on Instagram. That's something that probably they could improve indeed. Lavar commenting on Mandeville says, Mandeville is being highly developed, soon to be one of the most expensive parishes to live in. Proven has taken the lead with its real estate development. And that development is in a, you know, it's right beside Mega Mart. It is going up fast. I keep watching it every day, looking at the progress. Like I said, Sovereign is coming to Mandeville. I see that they're redeveloping an entire plaza 
there and it's not the sign is up and it says sovereign and you know other things are coming to the space so i definitely think it's a place to watch but maybe i should keep that hush hush because i don't want prices to go up too much right i can't buzz the secret uh let me see what else we have Tariq says i want jsc to be the central stock market for the caribbean I think it kind of is right now, at least for the English speaking Caribbean. I don't know much about, you know, the, the Spanish speaking Caribbean, Dominican Republic and so on. Uh, what's going on over there? But in the English speaking Caribbean, it definitely is the most active uh, stock exchange in this region. Jano says leadership change is needed to enable renewal. You're referring to Palace. What, what are you referring to, Jano? And then Garth says at a bowling alley and an arcade. You guys coming through with the ideas for Palace. That's a completely different business though, but bowling alley entertainment. So you go bowling, you watch a movie, you get some snacks, interesting. And then LeVar says, make sure that you are locked into KRM for the rest of the year. That's absolutely 100% the best advice on this entire show since it started. Thank you so much for that, LeVar. And reminding you once again to hit the like button, make sure that you like the video and share with somebody. It's very, very easy to share, whether you're on Facebook or on YouTube. Let somebody else know that the show is going on. That's our show for this week. Thank you for watching. Subscribe to the channel, share with a friend. And of course, subscribe to our newsletter at kalilareynolds.com slash newsletter, reminding you that new email subscribers get a copy of my free broker guide. And that will give you a comparison of all the brokers in Jamaica, what their um, clients say about them, what their online platform is like. We're looking at updating that very soon as well. Turn on those post notifications so that you can be the first to see everything when it comes out. We want to help people learn more about money so we can all get this money together. Follow me on Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok at Kalila Ray. That is my only page. I have no backup account, so do not uh, follow up anybody who's telling you about any, you know, give them money for crypto investing. That is not me. And follow our business page, which is KRM underscore business news on Instagram. If you want to connect with the analyst this week, which is David, check the description box below for his contact information. And also visit our website, kalilareynolds.com, for financial information you can use however you like it. You can watch, you can listen to our podcast, guys. If you're watching this right now on YouTube or Facebook, you also have the podcast option, which is, of course, delayed. It's not live on podcast platforms, but we are on most of the major ones. We're on Apple, we're on Spotify, we're on Pandora, we're on TuneIn, we're on just a bunch of them. And of course, you can also read our articles. Now tell a friend about taking stock because investing is the new sexy. So let's make it cool to talk about money. I'm Kalila Reynolds. I'll see you later. Let's get this money. <laughs> <laughs>